Every so often you meet someone with a genuinely fascinating insight into their area of expertise. Someone so passionate about what they do that you just have to make some time to listen to them. Brian Sansom, owner of BKS Made to Measure, is one of those people. So I went to his workshop in Exeter to talk about why he's so obsessed with making the safest possible riding kit. This is a long video, but if you're interested in how a self-taught tailor built one of the most respected names in motorcycle clothing, it's worth a watch. And also, if you want to know how bike textiles can be made far safer than the vast majority of kit currently on the market, then grab a tea, coffee, beer, whatever, and settle in. I'm hoping to do more of these videos where we meet the fascinating people in the UK's motorcycle industry. They're not sponsored, they're not adverts for the brands, they're just people and businesses that I think are genuinely interesting. I've got several in mind, but let me know in the comments below who you'd like to meet. So, I'm Brian Sanson, BKS Leather. Um, started the business uh, back in 1986 uh, with the benefit of a government initiative back in the day which was called the Young Enterprise Allowance Scheme where Maggie Thatcher kindly gave £50 a week to small businesses who could demonstrate a £1,000 startup. And so um, that's how we came about. Uh, I had studied as uh, an engineer at Exeter Technical College prior to that because uh, I was only 21 when I started the business. But um, I suppose my uh, training has come from being a self-taught uh, tailor of punk clothes for myself in my youth. I was making fashion leather clothing at the time. Uh, had the opportunity to repair some clothing for Devon and Cornwall Police who called upon me as a local leather tailor shop. Uh, and shortly after, Devon and Cornwall were talking to Dorset, who said, I don't suppose you make suits either. Uh, and I said, well, I can. And, and that's how our motorcycle clothing came about. Um, so I went from a one man band uh, working from home um, to employing 15 people within my first five years, rented a local workshop, uh, then bought that then moved into the premises we're in today, um, grew to a team of 25 people, uh, and now we're back to a team of 12 people. But we've been going for 36 years. We like to describe ourselves as the Savile Row of the motorcycle suit with Rolls-Royce quality product. Um, it seems the right thing to do in so much as with made to measure, we can make it however you want. Uh, and with clothing being of a protective nature, it makes sense to do the best job you can with it. Um, so we've got a great team. Um, my team currently divides up to uh, front of house. We have Alison who looks after everything administratively uh, wise for the company, um, from dealing with customers at first contact to organizing everything you can think of behind the scenes from stock to um, sending the suits out to customers and, and everything you can imagine. Um, and then we have um, a one person pattern making department where we use state of the art CAD programming for pattern making that produces all of our patterns digitally and cuts them millimeter perfect on a vacuum control cutting bed. Uh, we then have a cutting room where we cut about five or six suits a week. Uh, each suit takes about 10 hours to cut, having had the patterns made, which take about 20 hours per suit. So very, very labor intensive work. And then we have a workshop team of six, seven people who uh, produce the suits from start to finish. Each suit maker produces one suit each from beginning to end. And then we have a very clever IT guy, uh, a guy called Fraser, who looks after all of our uh, IT and is our tech air airbag technician. So we're a small team. Most of what we do is motorcycle leather suits for UK police forces. We supply a lot of the public sector uh, with anything from one piece racing suits to two piece touring suits. And now we've introduced high performance textile suits. Everything we do is uh, and has always been CE approved to the highest level of certification, starting with Cambridge Standard back in 1994, then through to EN 13595 in 2002. We pretty much cover all aspects of motorcycle clothing, leather, textile, repairs, alterations, airbags, 
uh, and some ancillary garments like base layers and wind stoppers, etc. So it is fair to say this is BKS made to measure limited, isn't it? Because there is still some BKS off the peg some, sometimes? Uh, yes, so there are two BKSs. Um, we are the original BKS made to measure uh, and there's a second BKS called BKS Limited that uh, we started off as a project with Frank Thomas back in 2008 where we wanted to have a wider audience that we couldn't meet with ourselves and they felt that by joining in with us and buying our trademark from us could set up a new company, especially for Off The Peg. That went very well. Um, they, it was like their premium. A, a, a yeah, premium so Frank Thomas back in 2008 were expanding their own portfolio. Yeah. They were buying other companies. They were creating more than just their own product range with Lintec and um, Lewis, etc. Uh, and they couldn't really bring out Frank Thomas Deluxe. So yeah. they saw an opportunity with us to have a premium brand in their portfolio, but one that was theirs, which yeah. involved me having to sell my trademark rights to them, which we happily did because we were still going to provide all of the made-to-measure service and the made-to-measure business would be still with me. Um, but their off-the-peg side to BKS would increase the range to textiles, boots, gloves, yeah. the sorts of things we couldn't really do ourselves. Uh, and that went fantastically well for three years. Um, they invested um, heavily. They uh, sponsored riders like James Tozen, top British superbike riders, Tommy Hill, uh, Stuart Easton. They had media involvement. That went very well until, unfortunately, the financial climate uh, caused them issues and they went into administration in 2011. That's meant a new owner, of the previous Frank Thomas uh, portfolio came along, JNS Accessories, and the BKS Limited is now part of their setup. Uh, and we work independently from each other. Um, we still do all of the made to measure. They uh, provide a range of, a wide range of BKS off the peg products, but the two of us aren't connected in terms of what we each make. Yeah. Now, the reason I wanted to talk to you was about safety kit. Uh, and I've worked in the motorcycle industry for 26 years, I think now, and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, but your brand has, VKS Motormotion has always been about some of the safest kit you can buy. Yeah. Uh, and it was only recently I found out that you've started making textiles. We, we already know about your leathers, you know, they're, yeah. they're very high performing leathers designed for multiple crashes effectively as well, yeah. aren't they? And yeah. something that can last a lifetime. But you've started making textiles that meet the toughest EN 13505 certification. So can you briefly tell our viewers what that test standard involves? Okay, so EN13595 is a test uh, or is a standard which involves three headline tests and um, involves abrasion, impact cut and burst. And those are the three main threats that any garment faces when a rider crashes and slides along the road. So EN13595 is in fact a uh, originally a copy of the Cambridge Standard, where BKS were the first ever company to gain CE approval way back in 1994, where the Cambridge Standard had three levels of performance, low, normal and high, and EN 13595 became the homologated version of that when the European Commission decided that the motorcycle industry should have a Europe-wide standard. And with Cambridge's permission, uh, EN 13595 was born, and instead of low, normal and high, they had levels 1, 2 and 3. Except when it went to publication in 2002, EN 13595 had level 3 dropped because, uh, I guess, it, other industry players pushed back on that level of performance, saying clothing that thick, that heavy, would be too difficult to manufacture, unwearable, etc. And yet, for eight years leading up to that date, we had enjoyed many police forces and many customers, hundreds and hundreds, all perfectly happy with level three standard clothing. Um, so we continued with that, but effectively the EN 13595 standard that is in place now, um, although that's about to be delisted later this year, provides a set of test methods for motorcycle clothing 
to meet high standards in line with the typical crashes and road speeds that most motorcyclists do. It ended up as almost like a optional standard for people to te- for brands to test to, didn't it? Because it was, it, in some ways it was hard to achieve. Yeah. Um, and it could mean that some gear for uh, mass production would have been hard to achieve that or hard to keep at costs. And, but we never, it meant that people, that it meant that brands in some respects could just call their product, they weren't supposed to call their products protective if they weren't certified as protective, were they? Correct. So you could rightly say, this is protective equipment. And that was the law. But as time went by, more and more adverts and marketing started saying about the protective qualities of items that hadn't been proven to be protective. And that was why the new EN 17992 came in to force everybody to prove that everything was protective. So we now have this new standard that by law, all motorcycle kits sold in UK and Europe yep. has to be certified to. It can also be certified to 13595. Yeah. <clears throat> but so why aren't you using 17992, AAA? We hear it said that it, this is, it's the top level. It's as safe as the best race leathers. You have to remember that all the time the N13595 existed. Sadly, most of the industry avoided it, partly because they could if they didn't claim protective performance from their clothing. And so most garments were simply fitted with EN1621 compliant protectors, elbows, knees, hip, shoulders, back, etc., into non-compliant clothing. What wasn't quite fair was that brands would claim protective performance from their clothing. And that's why the European Commission stepped in in around 2014, 2015, and it became a new standard uh, and a legally required standard. But this was almost a standard which was created in reverse for an industry that had so much clothing in play already that EN13595 would have wiped out so much of it that the new standard had to encompass much lower levels of performance to give a much wider scope and choice of clothing, which was now proving to be more popular, ranging from denims to lightweight nylon jackets, etc. So I get all of that. Um, and it certainly makes sense because it means that everything now that goes to market does have to be tested, as opposed to most of what went to market never was. So it's bringing all of that in line, and I think that's great. However, the new standard has a change in the headline abrasion test, which means that the destruction test on materials using the abrasion method in 17092 allows seemingly a lot more lower performance material to pass it. And so it's not that difficult to reach AAA. Uh, And if we'd certificated our products to AAA and anything else to do with 17092, you wouldn't have been able to tell the difference between a highly superior leather suit or textile suit such as ours compared to another mid-range garment, which would still pass AAA. And so you'd have too much clumped together in the top end where if a guy was going to go and buy something that triple a and he wanted the best he could get that category still encompassed such a wide range of clothing that he couldn't possibly work it out for himself so we actually disagreed and challenged 17092 coming in but the rest of the industry uh, and rightly so wanted to have something for the greater good and we hoped that in the fullness of time that there could be a 4A and perhaps a 5A category introduced into 17092, which would help establish how suits such as ours could sit above the suits, which were still great at AAA, but not as great as 5A. It wasn't until Brexit kicked in that meant any certified product prior to then, if older than five years, meant that our own certification would now no longer be in date and would become null and void. And even though we met Cambridge Standard High Performance all those years ago and haven't changed and only improved the build of our suits, it would have meant we would have been left in a untenable situation of having no certification and unable to trade our products. So we understood that the option to certificate to EN13595 was still available to us. Um, We understood that there was becoming less appetite for... 17092 to develop into a 4A and 5A category in due course or quickly enough 
And so we decided to stick with the N13595. So this, effectively a, a British standard 13505, is something that coming out. I think it's probably fair to say, well, we won't go into to a CTO and talk about names. You're not the only company that wants this either, are you? It's not all about a, a, a made-to-measure company protecting their interests. Hmm. There are off-the-peg brands that are also believe this is the right thing to do. Yeah, I I think, um, you know, across the wider market, and now there's more and more focus on standards like this, um, and the realisation that stuff that's passing AAA on the abrasion test method in that standard is actually failing at something like 90% lower than what it takes to pass level two in EN13595. And so it's showing that it's not that difficult to pass AAA and it's not the ceiling level. Uh, There has been appetite for a British standard version of EN13595. um, And that's partly being driven by UK police who don't want to be left with choice that only comes from 17092 protocol type garments because it will force their choices to be much lower than what they've been used to wearing. And despite various comments about how some of this gear is too hot, too heavy, etc., we have police forces who have been wearing it for over 30 years who tell me they are perfectly happy, perfectly comfortable. Um, there are so many things that can be done in a suit that still does enough to meet these standards. There's room for it and there's appetite for it. And I think there are other companies um, who will want some of this and who are actively joining in or, or who have been part of it all this time. It does sound like you, you, know, you, you do believe that uh, safety and comfort don't have to be mutually exclusive. Now, there have been uh, garments, textiles even, made to 13595 uh, in the past. There's very, very few now making them. Mm. Uh, and where you're making 13595 Level 2, which is pretty much the highest performance you can get you're making that in textiles how important is that made to measure element is that what makes them wearable made to measure will play its part uh it's not essential um but with such a variety of body shapes females and male riders um it's not that easy to get great fitting motorcycle clothing once you start to stray from let's call it doctor's wall chart type sizes so unless you're typical build the right height for your weight, etc. cetera. Um, motorcycle clothing fits quite accurately where it touches. And it's a neat fitting suit, certainly a leather suit. Um, and unless it fits you very well, they can be uncomfortable quite quickly. And they can be even worse if they are thicker and heavier and you know all the kind of things associated with what it takes to build a suit to EN13595. I know there's all sorts of scenarios out there where you can get away with wearing lighter weight stuff. But from a made to measure point of view, that's not for us to participate in because we're a business at the end of the day. We can operate successfully financially if we make top end stuff, which is so much more labor intensive anyway. But in truth, it would cost over £2,000 to make you a suit out of paper if we still did you a made to measure suit with all of the panels and all of the intricate details that our suits are made with and none of that are necessary they're all part of how we prefer to make our suits a suit made from decent thick leather or lots of substantial reinforcement areas doesn't have to be uncomfortable but it's not just the suit itself that deals with that so from what you wear against skin compression fit base layers will help um keeping yourself cooler so a suit fully vented with perforations will help from the outside. We have technical linings which have coatings on the back which actively regulate your body temperature and keep you cooler for longer. Our police force and public sector riders all love it. It's all about the whole package Um, but that's why we do what we do because we believe in top end safety and to deliver a suit that's capable of being worn comfortably it's not just how thick your leather is and how strong your seams are. Yeah, actually, you say about the leather, um, your your textiles are meeting the same testing standard as mm. leather. Personally, would you say that the textiles are as protective or is leather still the, the ultimate? 
Truthfully, the leather suit is still the more, the more protective. Yeah. Um, in EN 13595, uh, high risk areas have to pass seven seconds minimum on the Cambridge abrasion machine. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, when there was a level three or Cambridge standard high performance, it was 12 seconds on those high risk areas. But uh, in truth, you really don't put the suit through that level of damage threat yeah. so that you completely write it off in one crash, really. Yeah. Um, so whilst a leather suit offers repeat crash and can go up to even 25, 25 seconds or more, we've had testing done, um, then a leather suit will survive better. It will be able to be reused again in a crash perhaps more than once, twice, three times. But a textile suit is still passing the levels of threat that a rider faces yeah. in crashes which are deemed as requiring high-performance clothing. Yeah, so those leathers could be great for club racers. They might yeah. be coming yeah. off multiple times and don't have time to come back and get you to repair it. Because anything can be repaired as well, yeah. can't it? Yeah. But there's a, a, a police suit um, that you've got that has... A small hole in one layer on the shoulder, isn't it? Yeah. And some scuff marks. And I think that's where people get hung up on these abrasion times. Yeah. I'm being very... Uh, there's a reason I'm not calling them slide times. They yeah. are abrasion times. But I would imagine that hole probably happened when that officer hit the road. Yeah. Um, because of the energy that went into that. So where we're looking at comparing products, comparing constructions and materials and how long they can last on this rig. Mm. That's not saying, well, I'm never going to slide for 25 seconds. Correct, five exactly. That. Yeah. It's, it's, that's not, you might yeah. hit down one second and there's a hole in it and yeah. something that supposedly has a slide time of yeah. X. The slide, the slide times don't really exist. The abrasion times are the abrasion times on the repeat lab test equipment. Um, and they are meant to be indicative of then how good that material is out in the real world. Um, but you can do more damage in a lower speed crash being a heavier rider yeah. falling more abruptly than you can falling off at 100 miles an hour and gliding gracefully up the racetrack. Yeah. So, yes, there's a lot more science going on into it and the ability to say, I've got a suit that you can slide for 20 seconds down the road isn't a real life quote to make. No. So um, that's certainly one thing we want the general public to get away from yeah. digesting as if it is. Yeah. You talked about impact a moment ago. What kind of armour are you using? Because I saw outside, there's what looked, if people don't realise, um, there are like standard sizes for armour that you see yeah. in most garments. And there are some brands use bigger armour. Yeah. And it looked like you're using pretty big armour, aren't you? What, what kind of stuff you put in there? All of our suits, customers can choose from essentially three armours that we've chosen to be part of our offer yep. if you like. Knox is a fantastically respected brand for armour and we put that as uh, as our entry level armour if you like. Yep. Their range is good in so much as they have a good range of sizes for each of their shoulders, elbows, knees, oh. hips, which enables us to then pick according to the size of the customer. Yep. Um, whereas you were mentioning how some armour in some suits is a little bit too standard if you like and it's not a yep. one size fits all. For Customers who um, want something a bit better. We've actually had our own armour made. Companies in Italy are some of the world's best at injection moulding. Yeah. And a lot of injection moulded components, whether it's motorcycle related or otherwise, comes from Italy. Um, uh, and in fact, <laughs> here we go. We have some um, armour which we've had in place since 2008. Um, it's a high performance level two armour. But uh, the company that we are working with for this allows us to design our own shape, thickness, proportions. On the shoulders, we've got left and right orientated. On the knees, we've got left and right orientated. Um, and it's lightweight, um, so it's no heavier than pretty much anything else. Yeah. We've gone for slightly bigger proportions so that we are covering more of your limbs than perhaps some of the standard off-the-shelf armour, yeah. 
Um, and this we provide as an upgrade option within our suits. It's got a nice comfort skin on the inside, which makes it a little bit less hot and sweaty to wear yeah. something else related to trying to keep our comfort as enhanced as possible. Yeah. We're trying to find the best ingredients to create the best dish yeah. we can come up with. The finest leather, the finest linings, the finest components, um, the finest airbag systems. We want to have the best of all the best bits because it makes sense for us at least yeah. to try and make a motorcycle suit as good as it can be because yeah. there are people out there who want that. Yeah. And whilst we don't compare price-wise with your mass market, one never could. So what so, kind of prices are we? And sorry, we'll talk about armour. Yeah. I know you use D3O armour as well. Uh, we, we've got some of that. We do um, occasionally get asked to put in lighter weight armour. We use D3O for their back protectors, which we like because yeah. their range of shapes and sizes and profiles um, seems to sit more nicely in yeah. our suits. So from an aesthetic point of view, they are our choice brand for back protection. Yeah. Um, but essentially, anything that meets EN thirty, uh, sorry, EN one six two one dash one level yeah. two, yeah. Uh, is pretty much equal. So you'll always um, use level two in your yes. Yeah. So what do they cost? We acknowledge that people come to us to be able to choose everything about their suit, and not yeah. everybody has every single bell and whistle going. Uh, and some people can only just about afford what we offer. So. From an entry point of view, we start our made-to-measure leather suits and textile suits, for that matter, uh, at the same price at two and a half thousand yeah. pounds. Um, in fact, the textile, the material that we use in our textile suit, is more expensive than the leather we use in our leather suit. Yeah. And yet, whilst we stitch the textile suit using the, the same triple stitch seams that we use in our leather suit, we then have to go and tape seal to waterproof all the seams, as well, which takes an additional almost extra day. And that was a 12,000 pound machine, which we would never have needed for making leather garments. No. So um, our start price for our textile suit for an EN13595 level two suit is the same price as our same certification, certification level of leather suit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there are a whole number of things that you can upgrade along the way. You can upgrade from cowhide to kangaroo. You can add all sorts of extra features that you'd expect in suits depending on your use so if you're just happy for a plain black or plain single color two-piece touring suit without a speed hump without anti-friction caps on the shoulders without an airbag inside it then you're not really spending any more than what i've just said because yeah. you get all of what you would expect in a suit in our suit yeah um but we do upgrade linings and all these other bits and pieces that you can ask for and if you wanted to add every whistle and bell, yeah. um, and throw in latest state-of-the-art um, airbag system, then you can reach £5,000. Yeah. A suit should last a lifetime, really. Um, we have police force riders um, who have proven to us that over constant use, everyday wear, yeah. day in, day out, for a period of five years or more, they're still not coming back for stitching repairs. Yeah. So there's a five-year guarantee on our stitching purely because when we first set up our certification and were given guidance by Cambridge, we should put something on it yeah. and you should expect a suit that's designed not to come apart in a crash to easily not come apart through general use. Yeah. Putting a lifetime guarantee on it, uh, we could have done, but in truth, I think the suits are capable of lasting a lifetime. Well, there's one downstairs, wasn't there, that a uh, guy had a Prillia, uh, he had a Prillia branding on yeah, it. Yeah, 20 year old suit, grown out of it, still happy to wear it. Yeah. Um, needed a substantial amount of uh, size increasing around his torso and yeah. various other things um, and was happy to spend on what some people would spend on an off the peg suit on having his completely rebuilt to his current sizes and he's like three or four stone heavier yeah um you were so, you were you were saying it was something like a seven and five inch increases seven inches around the waistline and yeah. five around the chest we've all done it yeah <laughs> but yeah. was it, it I'm right in thinking it was about eight hundred pound, roughly. That, yeah. That it, he's made that investment in that suit mm. once in his lifetime. Yeah. And and so because I was going to ask you what happens if people put on weight or lose weight, you mm. can change that suit. It's too early to say. Obviously, the textiles they're quite new. How they'll how how long they last? But it's if you get an area in that membrane that wears out, can you fix that? I suppose now you've got that sealing machine. Yeah. In, in the, the same, same way, way as left. if he crashed in it and damaged the panel and it needed to come out, okay. we could put a new one in. Yeah, so it's not yeah. the end. Of it. So it, so it, it's 
we can look at this textile kit in the same way as an investment, mm. you know, a sizable investment yeah. for many people. You are making something that you completely believe in being the best it can be. Yeah. But what would you say to somebody who's watching this, maybe what, trying to understand more about the safety standards? We, I really want people to understand this is about choice. Yeah. And understanding the choices you make about making informed decisions, not influenced decisions. Yeah. yeah. What would you say to somebody who's just starting out or simply hasn't got the budget for this? Well, you know, I think like anybody who's starting off in a activity pursuit or otherwise uh, is presented with a minefield of choice. Um, and, you know, if you were taking up golf, you wouldn't go and get a handmade set of golf clubs straight off uh, or a set specially made. You'd, you'd see how far you get into it. So I get people want to... They want to learn how much they're into this for and how much they want to spend. And some people who even though they might get it, that of course there's going to be a Rolls Royce standard product from a company out there, right the way down to entry level and everything in between. I think the one good thing this new set of standards and this new legal requirement is going to do... In 1702, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it's going to hopefully allow consumers to trust the labeling that's inside so at least now it's not just a case of so uh, a rider's got this bike and he wants to dress in line with perhaps the look he wants etc fortunately now you can pretty much get the look you want and then there's every level of performance in that as well so you can get a rated jeans right the way through to triple a rated jeans yeah. you can get a rated leather jackets up to triple a and and beyond like what we do um, so I think, uh, first and foremost, I think at least now new riders, people new to the industry or new to buying clothing should just go by the labeling. If they want to buy the best performing garment they can get as well as from that category of style or whatever else they're looking yeah. at. Um, but if you were trying to maybe have a discussion with someone who wants to go racing or or certainly have more awareness of top end and sport orientated motorcycle clothing in a leather suit it's pretty generic to say just make sure that the leather looks reasonably thick it's got reinforcement in all the right places and when you can look inside check that there's two rows of internal stitching so that you can see there's a safety seam in there because even today there's stuff out there that doesn't put double leather or reinforcement material in elbows and knees and the backside like is the obvious place to put it. Yeah. Um, and, and unless you know what you're looking for, um, you can easily make a mistake. Yeah. It shouldn't be out there if it's protective. You should be able to trust that if it's made its way onto the market and it's got the correct labeling, then at that point, now it's just down to choosing what you like the look of, what fits you best, yeah. what suits your needs best and what, you know, how you want to look. So. What do you think the future holds for motorbike kit? <laughs> it's a bit of a crystal ball thing, yeah. but do you think we're going to see many more advances? Um, well, uh, I think the single most uh, improvement in kit that we've seen in recent years is the airbag technology. Yeah. Um, and BKS were exclusively chosen by Alpine Stars, who are perhaps the world's leading manufacturer of all motorcycle clothing and equipment and have been developing their own airbag technology for 21 years now finally went to market in 2015 um, with airbags that could be worn inside their own garments but to extend their supply chain they offered bks exclusive rights in the uk to manufacture our garments using their airbag systems and they've been doing this with one brand per country in the made to measure sector because it makes sense. It, it, um, it extends their supply chain of airbag technology to people who don't fit or don't want an Alpine star suit or garment or can't fit. Um, and it seems fairly logical. So that's something which has improved several times in the four years that we've been with them for that, um, with the latest one now being an airbag body suit where you've got airbag technology wrapping yeah. around your pelvis and hips, as well as fully across the chest, etc. So things have magnificently improved in that sector. And that's probably the biggest threat anyway for a motorcyclist when they come off is the trauma to internal uh, organs and 
various impact injuries um, because sliding down the road, wearing through, rubbing some skin away is a little bit more superficial compared to perhaps the worst of it. Yeah. Um, so that's clever and getting better. We're involved in another project with a company that has an electric bike oh, yeah. arc vehicle um, and they've asked us to make them a custom jacket which will go over um, an integrated display in the helmet and an internal body jacket which has haptics which will do things like tap you on the shoulder when there's a vehicle coming in your blind spot uh, and increasingly tap you up the back if something's coming behind you at speed and not slowing down. Those kind of things which are I guess all f more futuristic and to a degree in save, you know, enhancing passive safety and as well as uh, material safety. Yeah. So um, as I said before, there's, there's only so much development you can get from leather and materials and the ability for it to resist abrasion and those various things. But I think you know, the world is getting a more clever place and, and uh, BKS is very much part of that. This is, uh, you know, I know there'll still be arguments about this, but I genuinely think this is about choice mm. and people making the right choice. And I've ridden in, well, I, the last time I rode in jeans was when I fell off and I did hurt my knee. So I don't tend to, I will put on riding jeans. But, but, you know, you make some of the safest kit available. Is that all you ever wear? I've got a race suit. The other side of the room, I've got uh, a lovely Japanese leather cafe style jacket that I'll chuck on with a pair of jeans. Um, I've even jumped on the bobber on the way home dressed in a, a work suit for a, what is a, perhaps a mile's worth of riding. So we've all done it. We all probably will uh, yeah. again in the future. I think we know what, what we want to put on to deal with the threats that we're putting ourselves through. Yeah. Um, and yes, you know, like you, I've come off in a pair of ordinary jeans years ago and somehow uh, didn't wear through them either. So, yeah. you know, sometimes there's no rhyme and reason to this. But I think at the end of the day, it is all about choice. I think we dress accordingly. Yeah. And it's good to know what it is we're choosing when we want to dress accordingly. It, it's the, I think it's the, um, it's, it's the, the depth of knowledge we are all trying to help our audience have to make those choices better. Yeah.